funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Soybeans are found on dinner tables around the world. Some form of the soybean is found in baby foods, snacks, cooking oils, and many other food items eaten daily. And soybeans provide the protein in the diets for livestock and fish. The Nebraska soybean farmers support research to develop new soy-based products for foods, livestock, and industrial uses through their checkoff dollars. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. Coming up. Brad Lubin gives us an update on the Farm Bill, and Rick Rasby outlines supplement options for cattle. We traveled to northeast Nebraska this week, where we stopped at the Haskell Ag Lab and talked with Tom Hunt about bean leaf beetles. Ed Lammers will join us later in the show, but we start in the corn and soybean markets. In its latest crop progress report, the USDA said farmers across Nebraska had planted 14% of this year's corn crop. As you'll see in our footage from fields across the northeastern corner, Ideal weather from dawn to dusk should help jump that number for Monday's release. When we talked with John Moret from J.E. Moret Grain Company on Wednesday morning, he thought Nebraska planters would add another 40 to 50 percent for the week. We started our marketing segment by asking how many of those acres would shift from corn to beans when the last planter leaves the field. You know, we've seen a little bit of switching uh, to beans, but for the most part, not a lot. We think there's a couple things wrong with USDA. Uh, first of all, the overall acres is a little bit less, two or three million acres less than what we think it actually is. In corn, you mean? In corn, uh, in the total acres, Jeff. Total and acres. So when we look at the total acres, we think there's two or three million that come back into play on the June 30th report. Okay. And we think we probably are going to switch two or three million acres of the total pie will go back to beans. But that's still going to leave us close to 96, uh, 96 and a half million acres of corn. So farmers, for the most part, like corn. And so we think they're going to go to the ground and put corn in. And uh, there's maybe some beans, but not near as much locally as what, what we thought was possible. So you think that corn number is going to jump from 95, 9 up? I do. I think it goes higher. You don't, you don't worry about you know, seed shortages or anything well, like that? Well, I think there's seed, seed issues. I think the quality is not very good. But we still think that people are going to put it in the ground. And, and if anything, they're going to be cautious on how early they plant. That's why last week people were a little disappointed with Iowa and Nebraska. We think that's related to seed quality not necessarily the, the, the timing here of going to the ground. So As we talked today on Wednesday morning, soybeans are getting a huge jump. They saw one yesterday and it's a, a big part due to Argentine supply and what yes. they think is going to come out of that country. Is 15 realistic? I mean, what challenges, and, and remember we're talking on Wednesday morning, so by Saturday this could change, but what has to happen to reach above 15? You know, I think we've got to find more bad news. Uh, we need to find a, a smaller crop in South America and then we probably need to get some friendliness from the corn. And today, uh, as we talk, you know, soybeans are being pulled back a little bit by corn. Corn is lower this morning. You know, corn exports continue to be disappointing and we need kind of the, the all, all cylinders to fire here before we can take it above 15. But we think it happens. Uh, we, we think it happens kind of quick like. Yeah, the exports for corn, I mean, China is obviously helping out this week, or at least rumors to China. Do you think that continues, and are you worried about export potential as we go forward? I'm not. I think the old crop, uh, we would sell all we have. And so uh, Chinese have been small buyers of old crop corn. We can see on announcement this morning, uh, new crop corn, they've been a fairly large buyer. Uh, but we've, we're, we're going to have a lot of corn come October here, at least we better. So. No, I'm not. I'm not concerned at all. We need China as a trading partner. Yeah. As far as the old crop, uh, we see some of the usual buyers going elsewhere. So Taiwan, Japan, they've all found alternatives to source their corn this year. So the Chinese business is good. We need it. Uh, we're hungry to export some grain out of the U.S. Yeah, so with those exports, with a potentially short supply right now, a tight supply right now, at least before we get into harvest, what's your outlook for corn? Are you positive? You know, I'm not positive old corn. I think old corn can get back to six and a half, uh, but that's about enough. Uh, there's just not the exports to take us there. 
the new corn, I, I'm, I'm fairly negative, as you know. Uh, we think with, with 96 plus million acres, that will take us down ultimately towards 350 or $4 this fall. You think maybe this is a chance right now to, to unload what you have? Or yes, I do. Forward contract yes, forward. I do. If you get back to six and a half on old corn, I'm a seller. New corn, if you can get five and a half or, or close to $6 board, I would be a seller as well. So lay it out for beans then because it's extremely favorable right now. But you bet. if it does get to 15, God, that's a hard number to turn down. Well, the 15 is the old crop, Jeff. And yep. the problem is the new crops are, are 12 and a half or, or $13 cash this morning. So, you know, the problem is that you're 15 on old crop and you're 13 on new crop. That, that makes it hard for the farmer to sell <laughs> new crop. But if you happen to see 13 and, and a quarter or 1350, because I'm negative corn, I think you need yeah. to sell beans. Uh, how are you in terms of basis around this part of Nebraska? You know, Nebraska, northern Nebraska generally will lag lag the state here uh, because because we have a disadvantage with, right. of some rail up here. Uh, but it, it's stronger than normal. You can you can sell option price to July today, which is historically a very good number. You know, the problem is the, the board is broke 50 cents. So you pick up 10 on the basis, but your board's 50 cents lower. So for the farmer, I think he'd rather have a little weaker basis than a $7 board. You see a stronger one going into harvest though? We should stay strong in the old crop here as we scrounge up the last bushels. Um, as we get to new crop, I'm afraid we could see cheaper values as we try to put a big crop away. So as you saw in this country this week, there's a lot of ground that's been planted and, and tore up. So we should have plenty of uh, grain. One of those in the fields this week was Ed Lammers, a farmer from Hardington and the Nebraska Soybean Board District 1 director. Conditions are perfect uh, to be planting. Uh, the soil's really working good. Wish I could say the same for some of our equipment. Uh, we're about third done. Uh, the two guys that I'm in partnership with that we own equipment with, uh, they're over a third, maybe right at a third. So things are going well. Um, with these kind of conditions, you just want to work real well. You'll see our interview with Ed on animal agriculture later in the show. With five months remaining before the expiration of the current farm bill, lawmakers in Washington are facing an ever-closing window to pass legislation. Originally scheduled for Wednesday, the Senate Ag Committee began its farm bill markup Thursday morning. We talked with UNL Extension Public Policy Specialist Brad Lubin that morning and asked what the discussions entail. It's interesting, we've been waiting really for months for the farm bill process to get underway particularly since last November's uh, supposed framework agreement on what the farm bill should look like to achieve budget cuts. Uh, finally, the Senate last week announced a proposed cuts uh, and, and proposed language to, to begin discussions this week. Uh, it got delayed this, this week for a day based on some reaction and concerns about the language, but now we're underway in, in discussing today. What does the language look like? What does this farm bill or at least the proposals for it look like? Well, clearly much of the focus is, is on the commodity program and, and where we go with the commodity program. Uh, the Senate really took last fall's uh, framework agreement, uh, but modified it with some substantial tweaks in terms of what they proposed. Uh, essentially a revenue-based shallow loss safety net. So if you think about, you know, a producer expects to produce some amount of crop revenue. Uh, the safety net that's proposed in the Senate version kicks in at some percentage, 89% in this case, of that proposed of that expected revenue. The shallow loss program means that the safety net, if it kicks in, covers the first losses below that guarantee. But it also kicks out, and in this case stops at 79%. So it just covers the 10% of losses below the guarantee. The rest of that is the producer's responsibility. There is no safety net, there really is no floor. Producers have to figure out how to combine some shallow loss program here with risk management of their own, presumably crop insurance and other tools. And one of the problems that both the Senate and House say is, is coming to front is that the different areas, be it the Midwest and the Southeast or the Southwest, they produce different crops and so they need right. different things in the Farm Bill. Uh, that, you know, that's been a historical contention uh, that the Farm Bill is more parochial than it is partisan. Parochial in the sense of different commodities in different regions have different interests. That clearly came through with the concern about the initial language of last week. Uh, last fall's agreement talked about a essentially a myriad of options, a uh, multiple choice kind of farm bill. Here's a revenue safety net for the crops that like that. Here's the old price-based safety net for the crops that like that. Uh, for cotton, which has to come up with something new to satisfy WTO trade issues, uh, here's a crop insurance uh, alternative. This bill, essentially abandons that proposed price safety net. That, that old existing program, direct payments, counter-cyclical payments, gone. Uh, Acre is gone in favor of a new shallow loss uh, revenue-based program. 
the only thing that's still in there is the marketing loan from, from days of old. So, uh, so it's a very different kind of safety net that has a different uh, impact on commodities from the south, for example, as it does commodities from the Midwest here. The current farm bill expires on September 30th. How tight is this window to get something through by that point? Well, clearly we have to do something by September. Uh, the current farm bill expires and it doesn't just disappear. It reverts to language that is called permanent legislation that dates to 1949. We're not ready for that either. Uh, the likelihood that we'll pass a new farm bill by September is seems to be virtually nil. The Senate may in fact get its work done here in the next couple weeks or so uh, and get a bill through the Senate, but then the House has to act and it would appear that they're going to take a very different uh, track, at least in, in initial discussion. The chances of getting something through by September seem, seem impossible. You see a strong possibility that extends through the end of the year. That's right. At, at some way or another, we'll have to look for an extension. Is it a very t short run extension to try and prompt a lame duck session of Congress to finish this? Uh, or is it an extension that extends into early 2013? Either way, it'll probably come with some cost because of budget cuts along the way. So uh, there's, there's pressure to get it done and get it settled. Uh, the political challenges are, are difficult. At the time of this taping, the Senate Ag Committee had just started its markup session. As you probably know by now, BSE was found this week in a California dairy cow. The cow wasn't destined for human consumption and wasn't exposed to BSE through feed. Nebraska Department of Ag Director Greg Ibaugh said science-based protocols continue to assure safe beef and dairy products, adding, we are operating under the same circumstances as yesterday. Consumers worldwide can continue to enjoy beef and dairy products from Nebraska. A farmer's work is never done. While many farmers in the state continue to plant, others may want to consider scouting for insects. A repeated pest is the bean leaf beetle, but how big of a problem will the beetle or other insects be this year? Market Journal's Curtis Harms has the answer. Most farmers don't want insect pests in their fields, but that's not the case with Tom Hunt. This University of Nebraska-Lincoln extension entomologist specifically planted his soybean research plot early in order to attract the devastating bean leaf beetle. Bean leaf beetles are insects that overwinter as adults in like leaf litter and soybean stubble and tree be shelter belts and alfalfa stubble, things like that. And then in the spring, they come out very early, get into some uh, alfalfa, and then they jump into the first beans up. So in order to do studies, we try to maximize the chance of getting bean leaf beetles by planting very early. So we're trying to do some bean leaf beetle work here, and hopefully we'll get beetles. Uh, beans are just starting to crack through, and um, there were a few guys that might have got some beans in early, but we're one of the earliest ones that, that got this field in. While Hunt may have planted his soybeans early to increase the number of bean leaf beetles, he hasn't experienced the results he was hoping for. Mild winter conditions across the state may have impacted populations of not only the bean leaf beetle, but other insects as well. Insects in the state adapt to weather conditions. During a typical winter, it is cold with snow on the ground. This snow can insulate above ground insects as they are mostly dormant. Warmer conditions can have the opposite effect. Bean leaf beetles overwinter above ground in like leaf litter, so they're not down in the ground typically. And so warm weather sometimes in the winter can cause their metabolism to increase, they move around, they start to become active, and what that does, it uses up the fat body reserves they have in order to get through winter. So either they get active and they might come out of their overwintering site somewhat, uh, possibly then be exposed to then a spike of cold weather, or more likely, they starve because they get active when there isn't any food. They use up their fat bodies and they're not uh, in very good shape when, uh, when they do come out of overwintering and when we get to spring. So far this year, Hunt has found few bean leaf beetles. He credits these low numbers with the warm weather, but also believes agricultural practices may have reduced populations. Insecticidal seed treatments have become quite popular um, on corn particularly, but also on beans and uh, those are active against bean leaf beetles and we may have actually seen some kind of general population reduction because of that. While bean leaf beetle numbers may be low now, farmers should still scout regularly. An individual female beetle can lay hundreds of eggs, which hatch at different times during the growing season. They do have two generations in this part of the, uh, Nebraska, so you'll have a batch coming out in uh, oh, midsummer. Um, they'll mate 
and lay more eggs and then we get the late, uh, late summer population which feeds on pods and that's typically the, the most detrimental population. Bean leaf beetles may not be an issue this spring, but Hunt encourages farmers to scout regularly for problematic insects. When you have a winter like we had, things pop up. So you still need to be vigilant because even if the bean leaf beetle isn't there, um, other insects that we might not be as, uh, uh, see as often might uh, become an issue. Certain maybe lepidopteran pests, uh, caterpillars, things like that. Defoliation or webbing may be indicators of insect problems. For threshold or treatment information, visit entomology.unl.edu. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Curtis Harms. Thanks, Curtis. Dorn doesn't expect many insect control treatments will be needed during this early season, but encourages producers to continue scouting as population sizes can quickly change. UNL Extension cow-calf specialist Rick Rasby says now is the time to start thinking about supplement options for cattle. We talked with Rick last week and started by asking about the general condition for those livestock across the state. We've really had an easy winter and so for the most part cows are in good body condition. Uh, and I would say that uh, we've had a good calving season due, uh, due to the nice weather too. And so I really think things are, are looking good, at least for the cow-calf and the cow-calf industry in Nebraska. And, and again, calves are going to be worth a lot of money, at least with cow inventory being down. And so, you know, keeping them healthy and keeping them going in the right direction is going to be pretty important. People are feeling pretty lucky after that winter that we had. Yeah, isn't that the truth? <laughs> well, we're going to talk about supplements today. Right now, what are some things that people should be thinking about right now as we, you know, start to get into the warmer temperatures and getting out to pastures again? Well, you know, one of the things that we, we need to think about is that in some areas going to be grass tetany or grass staggers, and, and that's caused by low uh, uh, magnesium. And so the idea there would be to have uh, uh, a grass tetany mineral out there to get around that. And so, you know, feed a, this mineral starting about 30 days before spring turnout. So we're getting pretty close yeah. to, you know, uh, spring turnout in some conditions or in some areas. And so, you know, having them on some, uh, some uh, grass tetany mineral be important right now. And then, you know, the problem with grass tetany is it happens when you get some cold weather followed by warm weather. You can get this, this, uh, this uh, growth that's uh, not uh, stable throughout the uh, the growing season or growing time period and so once that growing period and the weather conditions kind of start to stable out and uh, ca and the grass continues to grow at a, a, a rate that's it's more normal then you can probably pull them off the grass tetany mineral. Yeah, and if, as we move off of that and into summer what are the other minerals then you start to work in? Well you know the the important one would be um, would be salt you know I, I think you need to supplement salt year-round and so having um, cows have access to free choice salt is important it's it's you know uh, salt's important in a lot of uh, uh, reactions in the body and so it's important to have that out there and I think from a, from for the most part you know supplementing some phosphorus at least through the breeding season is going to be pretty important and, and whether you need a full 1212 calcium phosphorus uh, that's probably debatable but you know something out there that's probably about six percent phosphorus six percent calcium at least through the breeding season is going to be pretty important. Relatively inexpensive this year or is it going to be as expensive as just anything else? Well you know uh, you take a look at it the most expensive component in that mineral program is going to be phosphorus so make sure that uh, that one is that you kind of supply some phosphorus at least through the breeding season and then make sure that they don't overeat right mm -hmm. and so uh, follow label directions and make sure they're eating probably about what they're supposed to be uh, eating according to that label. And then back to the salt after as well or well, not? Well salt would be during that time okay. period too but you know once you get past the breeding season you take a look at a lot of the grasses that we'd have here in Nebraska is that you know we're going to be pretty close to meeting that calcium and phosphorus need uh, for that cow and so whether you need to supplement a lot of uh, calcium and phosphorus after the breeding season is is debatable and really up to the up to the rancher. Speaking of up to the rancher, you were mentioning micronutrients, and you said that's maybe a situation where it's going to be case by case basis. Boy, and you know that's the challenge with uh, things like uh, copper uh, and those kinds of things is that it uh, it is dependent on ranch to ranch, and so kind of making some kind of blanket recommendation for for those kind of uh, micronutrients is is a little bit more difficult. If you think you have some type of micronutrient uh, deficiency, you know you might want to start out with trace mineralized salt, which is fairly inexpensive. And so going that right might be the way to go uh, if you think you have those kinds of problems. Rasby says even with favorable calf prices going into fall, producers need to monitor high input prices. The USDA's Consumer Price Index released this week projects grocery store food prices to increase 2.5 to 3.5 percent in 2012. 
For the same time, restaurant prices are forecast to increase 2 to 3 percent. While any increase may be unwelcome, the annual average rise for grocery store prices from 1990 to 2011 was 2.8 percent, meaning the current outlook falls within a normal range. Nebraska Governor Dave Heineman has been nothing short of outspoken in his opposition to the Humane Society of the United States, fearing that agricultural attacks from outside groups will hurt the state's number one industry. We talked with Ed Lammers this week about how he communicates with consumers and how he feels about groups like HSUS challenging individual farmers like himself. Uh, I'm concerned, uh, number one, I guess, and uh, number two, a little, little upset that, um, you know, I kind of really wonder what their real motive is to um, raising money to, they say, help animals. Well, uh, I wonder if their real motive is to drive animals out of our country, and, and that concerns me in the point, point that uh, if we do lose animal agriculture in the United States, that means we're going to have to import a lot of meat from other countries where we don't know what's going on over there. Um, I personally can say, and most of the people I know, and my friends especially, we do what's best for the animal. Because if the animal ain't comfortable, ain't feeling good, it ain't um, putting on weight, it ain't, it, ain't, it ain't healthy. So it's in our best interest to have a good mothering ability, a good, you know, to make sure that they're healthy and, and doing the right things for them. And, and if you can cut the stress down on that animal, uh, there's just a lot of things, you know, uh, it's comfortable, the stress level and the feed and all that stuff comes into point into play whenever that animal is feeling good. And if that animal is feeling good, it's going to yield good. Do you feel like that message is getting out or not? Well, it, it is starting to. I think we're behind, we're kind of behind these guys that are already you know, planted their seed and, and are kind of attacking us. Have sort of gotten the message out before? And I think we're playing catch up on that. So um, I think we're all starting to learn we need to do it. Before we always thought, you know, through our families that message got out and, and our families were big enough at that, you know, 20 years ago, our families were big enough that we were, there was enough of us to get that word out. Now, you know, there's third and fourth generations away from the farm and they don't have that contact with the farms anymore. You so, know, how, how do you develop that connection? Well, there's all kinds of sources. Um, uh, but the most effective source is that personal one-on-one -on -one pers one -on -one with a, an individual. I take a chance, like on an airplane. The guy next to me, I'll start talking to him what I do. I ask, you know, I try to ask him what he do. You know, but that's the most effective. Otherwise, there's organizations like, uh, you know, United States Farmers Ranchers Alliance. Um, there's a whole mix full of AFAN. You know, there's a bunch of good organizations that are out there doing that for us. But um, I think the most effective is that one-on-one -on -one conversation with that person. And, and I'm hoping that the individuals that are trying to, are having their opinion influenced, I'm hoping that they will see that what we are doing is in best interest for our animals. And as far as the other group, I'm hoping they'll see that not all their statements might not be true. And, and that's all I can ask for. And everybody has to make their own decision up, and I can only do tell my story the best, and I think we all need to do that a little bit better out here in Farm Ag. Lammer says if animal agriculture were to leave the country, it would be very hard to get it back. Each year, the Nebraska Soybean Association selects the state's soybean young leaders. In the April Nebraska Farmer, you'll meet Nathan and Stacy Dorn, the 2012 young leader couple. The Dorns farm near Hickman and raise corn, soybeans, wheat, and alfalfa. They also feed cattle and have a cow-calf herd. Nathan says the top issue to address is sustainability, not only in farming, but where is the next generation of farmers going to come from? You can read more about the Dorns and the program in the April Nebraska Farmer. Now, after a warm week in Nebraska, here's UNL Extension statewide climatologist Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here we are again at the beginning of the weekend. Of course, the last 24 to 48 hour period, we've seen precipitation move from west to east across the state as an upper air low moved out of the central Rockies into the northern plains. Some welcome moisture in regards to western Nebraska with the dryness conditions, although the panhandle was well below what I was hoping to see. It has not pretty much eliminated this last 90 day period where we've been excessively dry. We're gonna to need to see more precipitation events to make us feel comfortable that maybe we've moved around this dryness issue, but overall the trade's not trending the way we would like to see it, and I expect that we're going to see more serious stress concerns as we move through the month. 
particularly if we continue to see this lack of moisture and soil start to dry out and water demand start to increase dramatically as if we get an actively growing crop out there. Now, as we go through this next seven day period, there is a couple shots of moisture as we move through this period. Uh, we're backing off a little bit on the precipitation, but overall it looks like we're going to see a warming trend as we progress through the week. So let's take a look at the upper air models and see what we have in store. Here's our upper air low that's expected to move up into the Dakotas and the Western Great Lakes. And we'll see some clouds re remaining in northwestern Nebraska that may hold the temperatures down to the upper 40s to the low 50s. Across southeast Nebraska, as we get into the warmer air, we'll be looking at highs in the lower 60s and most of the precipitation will move out during this early morning hours. Now as we go into tomorrow, we see a little bit of an interesting situation. We have a southwest flow. We're expecting some thunderstorm development down in Kansas and Oklahoma, and that may rob some of the moisture coming up into Nebraska. And if that's the case, we're not expecting a widespread precipitation event from Sunday afternoon through Monday morning. If this thunderstorms generate a little bit farther north, then we could expect maybe up to an inch of moisture broad-based across southeast Nebraska. Really a fine line here, but overall, we're going to see a boost in temperature upper 50s across the north to the upper 60s across the south. As we get into Monday, we continue that southwest flow. Pieces of energy could move through this system, but there's not no widespread precipitation events, so it'll be widely scattered showers. We'll be looking at highs in the upper 60s of the north, the upper 70s across the south. As we go into Tuesday, we still continue to see that southwest flow. Not much in the way of any significant moisture. Once again, just scattered thunderstorms as they do develop. Highs in the upper 70s across the north to possibly the mid 80s across the south. This trough is expected to move through as we go into Wednesday. Comes shooting across the northern plains. It's a fast moving event. Precipitation is probable across the Dakotas, stretching into portions of northern Nebraska. Southern Nebraska looks like we're going to be borderline in terms of precipitation, a cooling trend mid 60s northwest to the low 80s across the south. That system moves to the east of us on Thursday. We start to see clearing conditions. We'll be looking at upper 60s across the northeast to the upper 70s across the southwest. And as we go into Friday, we start to see a good broad ridge building into our region, much warmer temperatures, low 70s northeast to the mid 80s to the southwest. That warming trend continues in through the weekend and the early part of the following week. And in terms of precipitation, it looks like above normal moisture will be east of us, dry to our west. Thanks, Al. If you missed any segments from this or any show, you can log on to our YouTube page or download the new Market Journal mobile app. Next week, Frayne Olson from North Dakota State joins us to analyze wheat markets. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Animal agriculture is vital to Nebraska. Livestock production not only contributes to our food supply, but also helps our rural communities. Livestock provides revenue for schools, creates jobs, supports Main Street, and enhances the future for farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Board's Animal Agriculture Initiative works to encourage growth of responsible livestock enterprises to benefit agriculture and Nebraska.